Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. The most central character in Franz Kafka's short story, In the Penal Colony, is the explorer. You can say that the officer is almost equally central, but, and that's true to a certain degree, but the explorer is the one who runs the course of the entire story, and we're, we're really getting the story primarily from the perspective of the explorer. It's not told in first person, it's told in third person, but the explorer is, you might say, the moral voice of the story. So we can't strictly identify him with Kafka as author, but it's the closest that we're going to get. And you could say that, well, there's other characters as well. There's the soldier, there is the condemned man. They don't really have that much of a role other than being, you know, involved in what, what's happening. It's really about the explorer who is making a judgment about what the officer is doing and telling him. And you could say that there's a third main character who is in some respects outside of the story by necessity. That's the former commandant who the officer was the assistant and really the only remaining follower of. There's also mentioned and who plays an important role in the story, the new commandant as well. And so what we can see going on here is one way of reading this, there's a struggle going on over the nature of justice and its application between the officer as the representative of the old commandant and the new commandant and the explorer is an outsider who's coming in who is being invited, in fact, implored to judge between these, <clears throat> these two sides and their merits when it comes to justice. So we should talk first about the previous commandant, the officer, and the machine. What we see here is that there is a deliberate innovation in the penal or justice system within the penal colony. You could say that in a way it's kind of a utopian scheme on the part of the previous commandant aided by the officer. And we're told by the officer, who may be an unreliable narrator, he may be lying, he may be embellishing, but let's just say that he's actually being accurate about the, the case. The previous commandant was sort of a jack of all trades, perhaps master of, of some as well, a great innovator, a charismatic person, and he comes up with this, this new way of executing criminals by imposing the sentence on their very body through an inscription of justice, which is supposed to produce understanding through horrible pain. It's written on the person's body. And it also provides a spectacle in which the other members of the penal colony can come and take place. According to the officer, they actually have to put like fences and guards up to keep people from mobbing this. It's almost like a rock concert in, in the type of spectacle that we're talking about. You know, people get really into it. And, you know, it's, it's not that big of a stretch. We know that in previous uh, political systems, executions were often times of public spectacle, even celebration in some cases. And so, you know, this is not implausible. Perhaps, again, there's some, some embellishing that's taking place. And so this is not just a practice 
This represents a whole, let's call it, attitude and regime towards the imposition of justice, justice against criminality, justice which is not supposed to just efface the individual or you know, destroy them or remove them from the society, but justice that is supposed to, through the medium of pain inflicted on the prisoner's own body, justice that is supposed to produce a grasp on the part of the condemned of what it was that they did wrong, what it was that they violated. And we know that there's, there's a lot of other elements to this as well. The officer reveals to us that there's no trial, there's no accusations actually heard and defended against. The prisoner may not even know that they have been accused until they're let out and put naked into the machine and they undergo this, this treatment, which turns out to be a sentence. And they have this horrible pain all across their body by being pierced with needles, having inscribed upon them, not only the sentence itself, not only the commandment, which they violated, usually just a single line, but all sorts of embellishments from head to toe as well, going around several times with the needles going deeper and deeper for at least six hours until they suddenly get the message on their own flesh of what the verbal commandment is that they violated. So this is, this is an entire way of approaching justice. And as I mentioned, it's, it's in some respect utopian. It's supposed to be an improvement upon previous ways of administering justice. But it can also, and we see this through the eyes of the explorer, be something very unjust, inhumane, you know, a form of torture, in fact. And so the, the, there's a present day conflict in the story. The explorer is being called upon to be a deciding voice in a conflict that is taking place, largely being won by the new commandant, but not entirely so because it's being fought against this officer who is trying to maintain this, this rather, you know, new tradition now become traditional of this, this, this regime of the machine, right? And they're, they're go uh, what we say, we're, they're in conflict or at loggerheads about it. Neither of them can get entirely what they want. It seems like the new commandant is winning. And so the new commandant, according to the officer, is bringing in the explorer to be the deciding voice. The, the explorer is going to, even with an offhand remark, like, well, we don't do torture where I come from. From or where I come from, we actually let people have a trial, that can be used. Any offhand remark can be employed as a tool to end this tradition. But the, the new commandant who doesn't approve of this machine has found all sorts of other ways of subverting this regime. A couple examples of this, the uh, prisoner throws up, uh, and, and the officer goes into this litany of complaints. Oh, they're supposed to fast for a day before their sentence, right? This isn't supposed to be the way things work. And, you know, we need replacement parts for this. Uh, who wouldn't throw up when putting into their, their mouth a gag that's been in the mouth of hundreds of condemned men? I, and then he goes on further. I try to get spare parts for the machine. In the time of the old commandant, we had, you know, basically warehouses of spare parts. The machine could be fixed all the time. It was in prime condition. Now, even just to get a strap, a leather strap, I have to take the old one and submit it. And it takes weeks before I get a new one. So he's, he's going on and on about how the new commandant is attempting to, you know, phase out this practice. The new commandant can't just say, listen, we're done with this and uh, get rid of the machine. Instead, he chokes it off. He makes sure that there's fewer and fewer occasions for the machine to be used. And th this is reflected by the people of the prison colony who don't come to see the performances anymore. They're not part of the spectacle. As a matter of fact, it seems like public opinion now has, at least according to the officer, turned against them. And so the officer is the last remnant, the last holdout for this, this, in his view, wonderful way of administering justice. And the officer views the explorer as a prime opportunity 
to get his point across. He says, listen, you have to be very careful about what you say. And I, by the way, I have a plan. I want you to um, help me out with this. You're going to um, tell everybody, you know, in this, this uh, gathering, you're going to tell everybody what you really think about this. He says, uh, the first thing is, is to be as reticent as possible today regarding your verdict on these proceedings. Don't say anything or give very curt answers. And then tomorrow, there's going to be a large conference of all the high administrative officials, the commandant, commandant presiding, and this will be turned into a public spectacle. Uh, you will certainly be invited to this conference if... if uh, you know, if, if you don't, then make sure that you get there tomorrow. You're sitting in the commandant's box with the ladies. He keeps looking up to make sure that you're there. And then I'll get up and I'll say, there was an execution yesterday. And then the commandant is going to seize the opportunity and say, aha, what do you, objective person, explorer from another country, what did you make of this execution? And that's when we're going to drop the trap on this terrible new commandant. You're going to say that you thought it was, you know, warranted. You're going to say that it is, it is good. He says, um, then at last you can speak out. I don't know how I'm going to endure the tension of waiting for that moment. Don't put any restraint on yourself when you make your speech. Publish the truth aloud. Lean over the front of the box. Shout. Yes, indeed. Shout your verdict, your unshakable conviction at the commandment. You do it however you want to. Tell them how they've been, you know, abusing the, 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 the regime of the machine by giving us no spare parts and requiring us to put a filthy gag in somebody's mouth. Tell them what you've seen. And the explorer says, you know, I will, in fact, give a verdict. I'm not going to give a verdict in this public way, and I'm going to do it behind closed doors. But you and I are not in agreement about any of this stuff, officer. And that is the verdict that he's going to give. There is a really great passage here that reveals to us how Kafka is positioning this, this person. He says, from the very beginning, the explorer had no doubt about what answer he must give. I think the beginning of this speech rather than the beginning of seeing the machine. He had experienced too much to have any uncertainty here. He was fundamentally honorable and unafraid. Now, is Kafka being ironic there and saying, well, maybe he isn't honorable? No, I think actually what is playing out here shows that we have somebody who is motivated in many respects by honor, by duty, by moral obligation, by, we can say, justice in the, the broad sense. So he says, now facing the soldier and the condemned man, he did hesitate for as long as it took to draw one breath. At last, however, he said, as he had to, no. Now, did he hesitate to, about what he should do? No, he didn't hesitate about that. He only hesitated about expressing it. Because what this meant is he had to say to somebody, you're wrong. I, I am not going to go along with this. I am not going to follow along with your scheme. I'm not going to say that this is the right way to do things. And so he says, I do not approve of your procedure. Even before you took me into your confidence, I was already wondering whether it would be my duty <clears throat> to intervene and whether my intervention would have the slightest chance of success. I realized to whom I ought to turn, to the commandant, of course. You have made that fact even clearer, but without having strengthened my resolution, on the contrary, your sincere conviction has touched me, even though it cannot influence my judgment. So he can say that, that listen, I get that this is really important to you. I understand that you are so invested in this. There's even like points to what you're saying that are not, you know, horrible and, you know, inspiring somebody with a sense of disgust or terror. But I'm going to put that aside because my duty requires me to say that this is wrong, fundamentally wrong what you're doing. I must judge the procedure, the regime that you have here to be unjust. So I have to render judgment. And then we see the character of this being carried out in two different ways 
during the self-execution. First of all, he allows the officer to do what they're, you know, what he's going to do, right? Which is to release the condemned man. And then he puts himself into the machine. The officer says, um, be just is what is going to be inscribed on my body. And there's a very important line here after the description of how the officer is putting himself into the machine. The explorer bit his lips and said nothing. He knew very well what was going to happen but he had no right to obstruct the officer in anything. If the judicial procedure which the officer cherished were really so near its end, possibly as a result of his own intervention to which he felt himself pledged, then the officer was doing the right thing. In his place, the explorer would have not acted otherwise. So again, he's motivated by honor, duty, justice. And he says, this self-execution is indeed the right thing. I would do that if, if it were me as the officer. So he allows it. But then the machine malfunctions. The machine breaks down. And instead of providing this means of enlightenment, it's just causing horrible injury and suffering to the, the officer. Right. And so he says the explorer was greatly troubled. The machine was obviously going to pieces. Its silent working was a delusion. He had a feeling he must stand by the officer since the officer was no longer able to look after himself. He's trying to figure out what can I do to end this. And of course, what they do doesn't help at all. By the time that they, they get the officer uh, and they pull the, the machine out, he's already been pierced in the head by the spike. But he, he did what he could. So the explorer is showing not just his verdict on the wrongness of this, he's also showing that his verdict is one that is, as best as one can be, objective. Now there is more to the story about what's going on. And I think that we can talk about the denouement of the story with this discussion of the social condemnation of the former commandant. They, they go to the tea house and in the tea house, um, they say the old man's buried there. The priest wouldn't let him lie in the churchyard. Nobody knew where to bury him for a while. In the end, they buried him here. The officer never told you about that because, of course, that's what he was most ashamed of. He even tried to dig the old man up, but he was always chased away. So where is the grave? It's underneath uh, a table, right? He says, uh, they led the explorer right up to the back wall, um, and they pushed one of the tables aside. Underneath it is a gravestone. So that's how much social condemnation there has been already of the methods of the old commandant. And there's a gravestone that says, here rests the old commandant, his adherents who must now be nameless have dug, up the, dug this grave and set up this stone. There's a prophecy that after a certain number of years, the commandant will rise again and lead his adherents from this house to recover the colony, have faith and wait. And so the explorer is seeing the last remnants of an old way of doing things, which was a new way of doing things, something that was supposed to be more just, but turned out in some respects to be even more unjust. And this is what it has been relegated to. It hasn't gone away entirely, it still has traces, but they're becoming ineffective. And the explorer's verdict plays a central role in this and a verdict that is given from a position of at least some sort of justice about the nature of justice within the penal colony.